Good day, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and thank you very much for this opportunity to address your very important uh, AgriSA conference uh, on at a time when the world is going through all sorts of tumultuous developments, some negative, some interestingly positive. And you ask an interesting question, how in that context does agriculture thrive and survive? So, Mr. President, I believe you've had elections this morning, so I'm not sure who the new president is, but let me address the president, the deputy presidents, uh, the CEO, Mr. Van der Rieda, uh, the heads and representatives of various uh, organizations. And uh, I trust that you will have a, a fruitful uh, conference. When we're talking about the question of surviving and thriving uh, as far as agriculture is concerned, clearly we need to take note of a number of new developments over the last year or so. And amongst them would be three fairly important trend lines or mega trends that I'm sure you will take into account as you go through this conference. And as my colleagues, Ministers Dediza and Creasy, uh, exchange their views with you as well. The first clearly is uh, the pandemic and the impact that the pandemic has had across the world, both uh, in respect of advanced economies, but particularly in respect of emerging and low income economies. And that impact has been economic, social, health, and many other uh, as impacts like psychological that we're still going to learn about as we truly move into a post pandemic period. The second mega trend, if you like, is the, the phenomenon of climate change, the urgency with which there is a need for the world to reduce carbon emissions and the various transitions that different parts of the economy, in our case, particularly the electricity and uh, transport uh, sectors of the economy, but parts of, I imagine, of the agricultural sector as well, have to undergo as we adapt to a new world. The third, uh, which both the pandemic and the climate change and the historical patterns of economic growth and lack of inclusivity brings to the forefront is the question of social and economic development in all of our societies and uh, the manner in which we actually uh, deal with them at the end of the day. Clearly what that requires is on the one hand for if you like business as usual to continue. But on the other hand, for thought leadership, business leadership, but also collective social leadership, which ensures that we understand what the mega trends meet for, mean for each of our uh, economic sectors. How do we actually conceive of uh, the recovery and reconstruction of economies and societies? Uh, as we go forward, and what does it actually mean for uh, new business models and uh, indeed social models as well uh, as, as we go forward. So these three trends have on the one hand important impacts for yourselves in the business sector uh, in whichever form you're, you're involved in it, but on the other hand, as you can see from many other parts of the world, where the slogan build back better or build back differently or build back in a way in which there's greater levels of economic inclusivity. We solve the problems of unemployment, particularly in emerging and low income markets and certainly in South Africa. How we attend to issues of food, energy and social security. And in particular, as I will point out from one or two quotations in a moment, how do we overcome the disparity in access to vaccines and the kind of divide that the vaccine uh, situation has created across the world where many have access to vaccines in the developed part of the economy? And now, uh, as we move away from vaccine jabs to vaccine pills, uh, 
the contest for access to these uh, very important health commodities becomes quite, quite crucial. So those two broad uh, categories is, I imagine, uh, an important set of factors to take into account as we ask and answer the question about survival and thriving in the context of South Africa's economic reconstruction and recovery plan. But South Africa doesn't live in an island uh, separately from the world. And so what happens uh, in the rest of the globe and some of the developments, both in terms of thinking, analysis, and uh, prognosis is quite important for us and for you as business leaders and us as government leaders to take into account. And amongst the key issues that we have to ask ourselves questions about and find very quick answers to is what is going to be the future growth economic model that is far more inclusive, that uplifts millions of people out of poverty and inequality and creates a much more just and fair economic and social environment. The second question is how do we ensure that the benefits that accrue from these economic models, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in industry, whether it's in the new digital uh, economies or indeed the green economy uh, factors that will begin to impact upon us, how will these benefits accrue to all of the citizens of a population or of a society? Clearly, one of the issues, and I'll make some reference to some of the IMF's uh, uh, numbers and uh, analysis in, in a moment, how do we manage uh, the fiscal burden that has been imposed by the pandemic and the need to both support society uh, at the lower end income levels, but also support businesses during this moment of crisis? And that clearly has resulted in serious fiscal challenges, which we as South Africa, but also more generally emerging markets are confronted with as well. Of course, the advanced economies have a different set of issues. Rising inflation, the issue of potential monetary tightening, and uh, how the allocation of the special drawing rights from the IMF will be spent. For example, the United Kingdom has some 25 billion I think it's dollars that will accrue to it. Uh, will it be spent on supporting developing countries to undertake the transition as, as far as uh, climate change is concerned? Or will it in fact uh, be utilized for different purposes that only benefit uh, the advanced economies themselves? So if we look at some of the data uh, that the IMF has uh, put on the table, so to speak, over the last uh, day or so, in its uh, global economic outlook. It points out that, and I quote, dangerous divergence in economic prospects across countries remains uh, an, an, a major concern. Uh, aggregate output for advanced economies uh, is expected to regain its pre-pandemic trends. But of course, the position of emerging markets is quite different. And this uh, pre-pandemic uh, trend line uh, will only be surpassed by 0.9% in 2024. It says, by contrast, aggregate output for the emerging markets and developing economy group, excluding China, is expected to remain 5.5% below pre-pandemic forecast in 2024, resulting in a larger setback to improvements in their living standards. It goes on to say that these divergencies are a consequence of the great vaccine divide and large disparities in policy support. And there's some interesting numbers that all of us need to take account of. While over 60% of the population in advanced economies are fully vaccinated and some are now receiving booster shots, about 96% of the population in low-income countries remain unvaccinated. And that certainly applies to our own continent as well. It then talks about a tale of two worlds. And clearly, there's a huge divide developing between the advanced economies on the one hand and uh, the emerging and low income economies on the other hand, as you will see uh, from the reports of the IMF uh, in this particular regard. So clearly, 
whilst we want the business as usual approach to dominate much of what we do, we've also as a country, as a, an economy and as important uh, economic players like yourselves, also ask questions about what, what is the paradigm within which we think we need to conceive of a model of growth that is both economically uh, successful, but also has positive social impacts in a country like South Africa that still has huge problems in terms of unemployment, inequality, and poverty. And here I want to quote from Professor Danny Roderick of Harvard University, who is also on the President's Economic Advisory Council, in a very recent article published in Project Syndicate, and where he says, and I quote, what then should today's growth model look like? As always, investments in human capital, infrastructure, and better institutions remain indispensable for long-term economic gains. These are the fundamentals of economic convergence with rich, with rich countries. But a growth strategy worth its name must enhance the productivity of the existing workforce, not the workforce that might emerge in the future thanks to such investments. Developing countries retain significant potential to increase agricultural productivity and to diversify from traditional to cash or export crops and sections of our agricultural sector have been hugely successful in this particular regard. That's my, my words. But he goes on to say, but even with more productive agriculture, and in fact, as a result of it, young workers will continue to leave the countryside and flock into urban areas. They will be employed not in factories, but in informal micro enterprises, in low productivity services with poor expansion prospects. So he says the next generation growth policies will have to target these services and find ways to increase their productivity, that is at the lower end of the economic scale. The reality is that few informal firms will grow to become national champions, but by offering a range of public services, help with technology, business plans, regulations, and training for specific skills, governments can unlock the growth potential of the more entrepreneurial among them. He goes on to say one implication is that social policy and growth policy will increasingly overlap. The best social policy that is enabling sustainable poverty reduction and enhanced economic security is to create more productive, better jobs for workers at the bottom of the skills distribution. In other words, social policy must focus on firms as much as households. And the new global and technological context implies that economic growth is now possible only by raising productivity in smaller informal firms that employ the bulk of the poor and lower middle classes. Development policy may become unified at last, he goes on to say. So that's one set of thoughts about the paradigm. But the challenge that we've seen in recent times across the world as a result of the pandemic uh, and as a result of the slowdown in economies, uh, and then suddenly the opening up that is taking place in the advanced economies, uh, and we don't, of course, fall in that particular category, is the huge supply chain problems that uh, various countries are confronted with, including our own in a different respect. And here I quote from the Financial Times of this morning, where it says that before anxious children can open all their Christmas parcels this year, ports worldwide will have to deal with much bigger containers. The UK's leading container port, Felixstowe, has such a buildup that Denmark's Maersk, that is the shipping line, has decided to divert its vessels. The supply chain blockages clogging sea freight routes could last for months. Felixstowe's log jam uh, of big metal boxes is causing sizable problems for the UK. It goes on to say this looks like a market failure. The empty containers are valuable, having doubled in price. Moving full ones in, uh, is highly lucrative. Shipping rates globally average more than $10,000 per 40-foot equivalent unit, triple the price of a year ago. Yet containers are piling up, contributing to their squeeze. 
I think you're also aware, and this article quotes, uh, I quote again, again, contrarians expect the low before Christmas New Year uh, in early February to provide the chance for supply chains to reset. More ships will eventually appear. Container ship order books have jumped to more than 25% of vessels in service. Uh, according to a particular research study, uh, though the number under construction has not budged. So we can see that the logistics issue is a critical issue that impacts both on you, uh, those of you that are exporters, and uh, certainly on, on the globe at, at large as well. What then is the relationship between this macro picture and what we are attempting to do within the South African context? Uh, and in particular in relation to the economic uh, reconstruction and recovery plan. South Africa has a recovery plan, uh, or the ERRP says, it has been beset with low, low growth, uh, low uh, gross fixed capital formation or investment in our economy, declining capacity utilization, and of course the problems of inequality, unemployment and poverty and food insecurity as well. On the other hand, there are many opportunities that are available to us as a country and as an economy. The IMF has uh, said that in 2020, we, our growth rate was at minus 6.4. For 2021, it anticipates a 5% growth rate. And in 2022, a 2.2% growth rate. Commodity prices, uh, mineral commodities in particular, have increased. And that has given us some kind of respite on the fiscal side which I'm sure the Minister of Finance will address in the MTDPS. Our social partners have all agreed on this as a plan for us to take forward. And clearly one of the issues that both you and ourselves in government want is a, a process of regulatory reform that will make it easier to do business in the South African context. The, the ERP, as you know, is divided into three phases. Uh, firstly, the question of engaging and preserving, secondly, the recovery and reform. And there's been some interesting progress through Operation Vulendlela, which is managed by the Treasury and the Presidency, and uh, particularly in respect of the uh, Transnet National Ports Authority and uh, greater competition as far as terminals are concerned. Secondly, in releasing the uh, spectrum. And thirdly, more generally, as far as the network industries are concerned. The third phase, of course, is reconstruction and transformation. The agricultural sector in particular uh, has an important place, both within the GDP of this country, although it might be numerically low, the potential, I'm sure you will agree, is quite great. So your contribution to an enhancing food security in the South African context is quite critical both in terms of the large producers amongst yourselves, but also in terms of the medium size and low uh, and the small firms uh, or efforts that are emerging. Secondly, it's important that we strengthen the productive capacity uh, of our economy and therefore further investments in the agricultural sector and widening of its net becomes quite critical. Thirdly, as I pointed out from Professor Rodrick's uh, commentary on uh, the issue of growth, encouraging small and medium sized uh, farming initiatives is a critical factor. And with the minimal exposure that I've had uh, to your industry, I know there are many players amongst yourselves who are doing a sterling job uh, and innovative things are happening in relation to promoting this particular area. A fourth area is the question of how agriculture contributes to industrial, further industrialization. And here, I'm sure, is uh, a question that preoccupies your mind as well. And that is, how do we have a process of industrialization that continues to promote value addition to agricultural products, so high value products are actually exported uh, from the South African context? The fifth is uh, the issue of en enhancing local consumption on the one hand, but importantly, the kind of role that many sectors of the agri agricultural community play in relation to export uh, capability being increased. All of this, of course, is going to be impacted by climate change. And so your views on how 
uh, climate change will impact on the agricultural sector on the one hand, but how we create a green industry uh, dynamic within the agricultural sector becomes an important contribution as well. And equally importantly, it's going to be the question of research and development and uh, the issue of uh, innovation within your sector as well. I know that uh, many of us have interacted in the recent past around the issue of logistics, uh, an issue I covered in relation to what the Financial Times had to say about the supply chain and logistics sector in particular, and the kind of log jams that, that are being confronted. But let me give you a, a general assurance and further engagements need to take place in this regard, that from a Transnet point of view, uh, setting up an efficient logistics sector to support the kind of growth and uh, uh, extremely good crops that uh, many sectors or subsectors within the agricultural sector have experienced in the recent past. And the encouragement of uh, exports is uh, a, prim a primary objective and uh, of Transnet. And we will continue to ask our colleagues in Transnet to make more and more facilities available, but also to increase the efficiency of the logistics system uh, far more substantially than might have happened until now. Transnet does uh, recognize that uh, the agricultural sector provides an important opportunity for growth for its own uh, business. And in that regard, uh, closer cooperation between yourselves uh, and colleagues in Transnet is quite critical so that we can both understand your needs, but you also understand some of the constraints that are South African based, but you can see that there are global constraints that impact upon us as well. We've done extraordinarily well over the last two years in promoting uh, fruit exports, citrus exports. There were disruptions in July this year uh, as well that was uh, overcome through cooperation with your sector. And that should act as a role model, if you like, uh, for future cooperation between uh, Transnet as an important logistics provider uh, and, and yourselves as well. The uh, timber industry amongst yourselves has also been approaching us uh, to improve uh, the availability of services to them. And uh, we will be meeting them shortly uh, with Transnet to understand their concerns and to go forward in that particular uh, issue. There are also going to be innovations on the Transnet side in terms of partnerships and cooperation between the private sector and, and government and Transnet in particular. And these could involve uh, private and public partnerships. It could involve concessions in relation to branch lines, uh, terminals, both inland and in, in respect of ports, uh, the ownership of wagons uh, by different sectors of our economy, including your own. And uh, these are new areas in which there should be further engagement uh, between Transnet and, and, and yourselves. Let me conclude by saying that the agricultural sector is certainly a, a cornerstone of the uh, economic reconstruction and recovery plan. Secondly, that government has every intention of uh, continuing to as diligently as possible and urgently as possible to implement this plan with your cooperation and participation. And thirdly, there will be many obstacles as we go on the way, but if we create the right level of trust in one another, and if we create the right level of partnership amongst each other, we will certainly uh, break through some of those challenges and ensure that we contribute to the success of the agricultural sector in South Africa. But as you, as you can see, the agricultural sector is not just about rains, crops and exports. It's also about uh, increasing the share of GDP that the agriculture contributes. It's about ensuring that within South Africa itself, we find innovative ways of ensuring food security for all 60 million people amongst ourselves in this country but also ensure that you run thriving businesses that contribute uh, to foreign exchange, uh, to the current account balance, and, in, and ultimately to your own well-being as a business as well. The world, of course, is, is, a, is a complex one at this point in time, 
and therefore dialogue amongst ourselves in a constructive spirit is going to be absolutely essential uh, so that we understand these dynamics, whether it's a logistics issue uh, or the post-pandemic, and we're not certainly not in the post-pandemic environment at this point in time, uh, but we understand the challenges to the emerging markets in a collective way and uh, look forward to moving out of any vicious cycle that we might be in and turn South Africa's economy and the various participants in that economy towards a virtuous cycle that will begin to produce hope on the one hand, uh, but concrete evidence that we are moving in the right direction. Once again, thank you very much for this invitation, and uh, I look forward to further dialogue amongst ourselves. Goodbye.